then without uh, further ado, uh, Lauren is going to uh, present this afternoon. Lauren is from the National Academy of Science, and she's going to talk about uh, from flood risk to flood uh, resilience. So, Lauren? Thank you. Thank you. Ha can everyone hear me? I'm told I have to stay in a certain zone here. So, um, I'm Lauren Alexander Augustine from the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. That is the whole name. It rolls right off my tongue. And, and I run the programs on risk and resilience there. And so I know we, this morning we talked a lot about flood risk and flood hazard. And I'm going to talk a little bit about connecting all of that to flood resilience. So if you have questions, let me know. Al tells me we're not short on time, so we can be nice and relaxed. Okay, so this is a talk in three acts. And you guys can keep track of how much longer you have to sit there and listen to me by, based on one which act we're in. Um, so just some introductory stuff that you probably will already know. How we frame resilience and then by extension how to frame flood resilience. And then part three, some next steps we're taking in knitting all of this together. And that's a pretty exciting big project we have in mind. Okay, so we'll get started. Um, like I said, part one, start, start your clocks. So I am a wetland hydrologist. And so for the longest time, when I was just a child in graduate school, this was my full world view of a flood. <laughs> and I did my PhD dissertation work on the forested wetlands of the Chesapeake Bay. And we were always on a river because that's where a flood occurred, right? And then later, well, this was actually earlier, but you, know, you get the point. You start thinking about big rivers flooding. 91, Mississippi is behaving itself. 93, not so much. But this is what we learned about, about in terms of flooding. We get a little bit more sophisticated, and FEMA says, absolutely right. It is a river that floods. And when it floods, you're either in or you're out of a flood zone. This is stuff that, that made sense in my narrow geometric worldview. Then I opened my eyes a little bit and it turns out that there's other kinds of flooding. Like the ocean sometimes comes onto the land in different ways and we have coastal flooding. And this is a FEMA map obviously and even the Great Lakes are considered coastal flooding, right? And then, wow, now I'm working at the National Academies as a full adult. Katrina happens. I'm like, oh, this is coastal flooding. <laughs> now we have a coastal event, right? And then New Jersey hits. Uh, Sandy hits a few years later. And then a few days ago, we get another version of coastal flooding on a set of rivers in North Carolina, right? And then you start to look at other kinds of floods, because at the National Academies, we have to be fulsome in how we take on these things. And you start to get blue sky, blue sky flooding. It's not even raining, and it's flooding. Sea level rise and nuisance flooding. And in Annapolis, not far from where I live, but where Victoria lives, it, these days of being wet when it's not even raining are increasing. Two years ago, Ellicott City in Maryland just south of Baltimore, had this enormous rainstorm just sit on top of it. And so now we have extreme precipitation adding to our flooding mix. And when I say extreme, we're talking about six inches in two hours. This is a lot of rain in a small area in a very short period of time. And just as a little editorial comment, Ellicott City was a mill city, and so it was designed to channel the river so that the mills could grind the flour or whatever they were grinding. So when you get this kind of rain in the extreme situation in a place that's meant to channel water to be quick and powerful, but that was built 100 years ago, that 100-year infrastructure does what? It falls apart. And Ellicott City had a really bad July of 2016, and too bad for Ellicott City, they had a really bad August in 2018, two years later. Then there's other kinds of flooding. This is stuff that has nothing to do with a river at all. It might come up through your basement. It might come through a pipe, not a river overflowing. 
but it's still a flood. FEMA doesn't call it a flood, but if it's your basement, you know it was a flood. So we get asked questions all the time, like, how big is this problem and what do we do about it? Well, well the hint on this big question is we really don't know. So this question that David asked earlier about like, what are we going to do? What's the action? We need to figure out how to answer this question. Once we figure out what size this problem is, then we can start to design solutions for it. Moving on. But what we do know is that the shape of the impacts of floods are changing. They're evolving. They are becoming much more complicated, and they touch many more different parts of life. Older people, people are living longer. And when they get to a certain retirement age, if they have enough money, where do they move? To the coast. Great. Now we have people who, are, who might not be easy to move around living in coastal communities, and they're older. Um, we're going to talk a lot about how much money these things cost, but it's expensive. People are moving to the coast. There's all kinds of stuff going on. So these risks are not separate, they are connected in certain ways and they are evolving. So we're almost done with the introductions. All right, the academies, those of you who don't know, we are not part of the federal government. We were chartered by the President Lincoln way back in the Civil War, but we work really closely with the feds, but we are an independent nonprofit. Um, I always have to say that because then people think I'm from the NSF and they ask me for a grant. We never give out money. <laughs> um, so just to get that straight. Okay. <laughs> What's that? What did you say? <laughs> I'm a sink. We'll take any money you have to give, on, by the way. Um, our core belief at the academies is that we are trying to use science to the best of our ability and our collective ability to benefit society. That's it, right? And so I do this in the risk and resilience space. For those of you interested, Act one is now done, okay? All right, so in terms of framing resilient, who here wants to be resilient? See, all the hands go up. See, just like, see? This is what always happens. Everyone's like, yes. And then I say, well, who knows how to become resilient? Everyone's like, well, it's a little harder. I'm like, oh, but we have someone here who knows. Um, but this is a harder question, right? What is it? It's really fuzzy. I'm gonna spend the next seven hours talking about what resilience is. Um, I'm not going to do that. But th this question, th these two questions together, people want to be resilient and don't know how to get there. And so we're trying to fill that gap. In 2012, we produced this report. This report's now getting long in the tooth, but some people where I work say it's an oldie but goodie. Use whatever adage you want. Um, it set out these four kind of pillars. If you're going to do resilience, you've got to do four things. You gotta know what the risk is. You have to understand your risk. You have to be able to communicate your risk before you can manage your risk. So there's a bunch of stuff around risk. You can't do it alone. FEMA's great, and they're really good when things really hit the fan, but it's not a FEMA problem. You know, if it's your basement, it's your problem. I can tell you that. Or your county, or your state, or your company. So it's about partnerships, and there's a lot of stakeholders involved, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, if you're going to invest in something, you probably want some guidelines as to whether you're making progress. This is around measures or indicators of resilience. And then the fourth thing that came out of this 2012 report was that it's about sharing information. And this last one, when the report was written in 2012, it was about sharing data. So a lot of the stuff that we see around the walls here and the work that we've done since, it's about sharing stories, lessons learned, best approaches, all kinds of information. All right, so apparently this has some animation to it because this is not the slide how it's supposed to look. Um, coming out of this, people came to me and they said, we totally want you to help us implement this report. And I was like, listen, we're the National Academies. All we do is give advice. You can take it or leave it, but we're not doing anything with it. And then the president said, Lauren, you're gonna do something with it. So we created the Resilient America um, program. Oh, wow, there it is, there's the math. 
Um, and this schematic, I was corrected many times, this is not a map, this is a schematic. Um, call this my happy map, and you can see that if you are a federal agency and you're looking out over the continental United States, you have a lot of stuff going on, right? Um, so we picked four communities for the Resilient America work, and we worked with those communities for four to five years, the last four to five years, on building their resilience. Seattle, the central, central Puget Sound region, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and Charleston, South Carolina. I want to say a couple things about Charleston because um, when we started this whole process, we thought people were interested in natural disasters. It turns out they weren't. But you live and learn where scientists are part of the, the, the process of discovery. And Charleston was selected because it is subject to 19 different natural hazards. It's almost anything you can think of except for sandstorms and volcanoes. That's it. Everything else can happen in Charleston, so be careful where you vacation. No. <laughs> um, and so when we got to Charleston, I told you guys I'm a hydrologist, and so it, hurricanes, blah, 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 flooding came up. And all the people in my round table and the experts we bring together were very excited. It coastal people, rivering people, estuarine people, everyone's like, yes, flooding in Charleston. And it just turns out there's a lot of ways to get wet in Charleston. But Charleston didn't care. They were like, we just don't want to get wet. We want you to keep the wet stuff away from the way that we live our lives, which is interrupting our economic development, our tourism. That was it. And that was the big transition from the flood risk to the flood resilience work. So when we frame flood resilience, we also use four dimensions. I do not have a thing with the number four. These things work out this way. But there's this physical dimension of flooding, which a lot of this is around the room. There's this information piece of, of flooding. How do you know? How, how are your data? How are your maps? How are your models? There's a big piece about information, which goes almost directly to risk communication, right? Then there's a social dimension. Who gets wet? How bad? How much? And then who doesn't get wet? There's a big social piece here. And then the last one is about decision making. And when you're talking about flooding, it goes all the way from the individual all the way up to the global flooding partnership. So who's making decisions and for whom? And it's not as straightforward as it seems. That's a big body of work. I'm going to touch on these just a little bit going forward. But the big question that we ask at every step is what is the role of science in these dimensions? So physical dimensions. We have so much information on physical dimensions. Our meteorology is great. Anyone in here a meteorologist? Anyone here helping with it? Thank you. Meteor <laughs> it's great. We get little alerts. The rain's going to come at 243. It'll be light. It'll, you know, <laughs> it's just great. And we use it. Everyone uses it. Steve Zubrick from NOAA gave us this. Um, extreme precipitation. Oh, it's extreme. This is also a part of our physical dimension of flooding, as is infrastructure, as is aging infrastructure. And this is a sound wall in Houston, Texas. Now, what do you think this sound wall does when it rains in Houston, Texas? It doesn't just trap it, it channels it, right? So some of these building choices, one un un unintended consequence for another, this is a stolen image. I want to thank the New York Daily News for letting me borrow it without permission. This is Baltimore, and it's a sinkhole in Baltimore. Um, infrastructure, some of it's massive. This is also Houston. The Bra Project Braze is a big U.S. Army Corps project, $500 million of federal funds. Some number of that is going to be matched by state funds, and it's still not done. Not going to be done for another four or five years. Started in 1974. So what's the role of science for this physical dimension? This, these two maps 
are are great. So this comes out of flood map. This comes out of a FEMA flood um, FEMA site. But this uses USGS data, NASA data, and I think NOAA data. All of this goes into this. So here's the role of science. How do we take these different layers of things that are important, topography and, and elevation and water level, and bring it together because this tells a different story than just a topo map, right? Social dimensions. Let me just tell you that people take flooding personally, and we were in Houston, which has, anyone here from Houston before I start talking about Houston? All right. <laughs> Houston has an amazing hubris when it comes to their engineering talent. And they should, they should be very proud of their engineering feats. And we had a guy who was head of public works talking about how great their infrastructure was in Houston. And we had this group of, you know, NGOs and whatever. And they were just like, your infrastructure doesn't help us. And it was almost a fist fight. And I've worked at the academies a long time. I've never had to break up a fist fight. I was worried that day. So the social dimension, this question about who gets flooded is huge. It is just huge. Chicago. Anyone here from Chicago? You're from Chicago. The big tarp project, right? What part of Chicago are you from? North side. So the north side got served first, right? Back in 1976. Yeah. The south side of Chicago, where black people live is still not served. And these people live on the south side. And guess what? They are furious. They're mad today. This was this spring. This fall, I lost track of time. This was re recently. That's me, actually, right there. But um, furious. Huge project. Interesting project. It doesn't serve all equally. The social dimensions are huge. This poor guy, he's had a, having a bad day. But then look at who doesn't flood, right? So this is a house in Houston. It's a sizable house, nice green lawn, perfectly manicured. And look at it's for sale. And what does it say? Didn't flood. Not here. Now, it may not be true, but that neighborhood, or at least that house, didn't flood. Um, so what's the role of science here in this dimension? Anyone here familiar with the social vulnerability index? In, index SOVI, right? Um, well, we have lots of smart people and people who know SOVI back and forth. And what they did for us in Houston here is they said, okay, listen, we're going to do some interviews. We're going to bring in the social science piece of this. And we're going to layer what we actually heard with the census tract data. That's the, under, that's the undergirding of SOVI. And we got personalized social vulnerability indexes for some of these select cities. This, when we gave it back to that stakeholder group in Houston, it made them feel a lot better. They're like, I can get this. Now, what it doesn't do is it doesn't go to the parcel level. So they can't find their house, but that's also where science can come in. All right, so we can say, I don't think I have a slide on this, but I go all over the country and the people who are most in, impacted tend to be poor. They tend to be brown, tan, black. They tend to not speak English as their native language. They tend to be elderly or mentally ill. The disenfranchised are the ones most, most impacted. And how do we know? This question of how do we know is where we need all the scientific grit that we can get. We need all of the grist in this as well to answer this question, because once we start making these assertions, someone's going to be like, I don't like this answer. It seems expensive. It seems like you're calling me a name I don't want to be called. It seems like you're saying my property isn't worth what I think it's worth. So how do you know? This is the most important question I think that we have for the flood risk to become flood resilience. And this gets to the information stuff. And I just got to say, oh my God, <laughs> we have so much data and information on floods. It's, we are swimming in it, no pun intended. And the hardest thing is sorting through it. What's meaningful, what's useful, what's right, what's wrong. So 
Everyone knows about NFIP? Everyone knows about NFIP. Anyone think NFIP is perfect as is? All right, me neither. But in many ways, it's the best we have. And the reason it's the best we have is because it's the most consistent across the country. There are holes in NFIP. There are inequalities in NFIP. There are problems with NFIP. But at least the problems are relatively consistent from Maine to California. And so my caveat on this slide, and so if you can read these numbers, the darkest red is from 5 billion to 10.6 billion on the bottom um, for this 10 year period. And this is just the floor. This, it, it can't be any less than this, and it is certainly more than this, but no one knows how much more. Okay, so this is one guess at, at the information we have. If you want to look at um, Houston after Harvey, uh, these numbers come down substantially, 134 million, right? But it's just one city, so uh, it's still a pretty big number. Our information tells us there's a line, and you're either on one side of that line and you're safe and you're gonna be dry and you don't need insurance, or you're on the other side and you are wet and you're in really big trouble and you need, and you need insurance. So this is information we have, it's just not necessarily the information that, that we need. Um, this, where is this? This is, is this also Houston? This is also Houston. So what I like about this, and it doesn't have a legend, and for that I apologize, but can you guys see the different colors? There are three colors on this map. There are the green dots, there are the blue dots, dark navy blue or maybe dark purple, and then like the color of wine, those dots. The green ones are in the SFHA, in the special flood hazard area. The red ones are not. Now this is Houston, Texas. And so you can say all you want about Houston, but the Houstonians know this. Doesn't matter where they live, they know they're getting wet. So they're buying flood insurance, which is why so many of their payouts for the NFIP are outside of the SFHA. But what this also shows is that the firms, the flood insurance rate maps that we use as floodplain maps from FEMA, they don't, they don't really, it's not quite, it's almost arbitrary, right? So that's the information we have. Again, Houston, are you in, are you out? Does it matter? Everyone got wet. So all these dots, all this money, here's what's not included in that. Uninsured losses. Fluvial flooding is not really a part of it. This is about daylighted rivers and coastal processes. So if you're talking about you're on top of a culvert, if you're talking about you have a basement, and you have seepage problems, if your sewage combined sewer stormwater system overflows, that's not flooding. That's, that's not in those, those claims, right? Overland flow, anyone who lives in a flat place or a dry place or Boulder or Phoenix, you had overland flow. That's not in that. Um, seepage, if you don't have a basement, probably not your problem, but when water comes from below, that's not flooding. Combined sewers, stormwater systems. If you live in a city that's over 100 years old, you probably have combined sewer, stormwater systems, right? Um, for those of us from the East Coast, that's most of us. Um, and what's also not included is the people. Who, is in the, who, who, who might be in the way of that water? The poor, the brown, the tan, the non-English speaking, and, and the older people. So that's what's not included. When I said that NFIP payout is like the base, it is the absolute floor. So here, the picture is just simply incomplete. We don't know how much information, we don't know the flooding picture, not in the United States, which is really kind of interesting when you consider of all the natural hazards, we flood every year at seven to $9 billion every year, and we don't know much about it. That's where we are. So the role of science here <laughs> is to help create a more complete picture is to complete that puzzle. Who go, who's gonna flood? When? How badly? How deep? How much is gonna cost? What they should expect? What's driving it, et cetera. All right, the last part of the framing of 
act two, um, is this decision making. And I am going to just be very brief on this because this is a whole hour long lecture on its own. But when it comes to flooding, there's a role for everybody. Everyone has a responsibility. It's barely a FEMA problem. It's barely a NOAA problem. It's like, it's all no man's land. So it's, feds do have a role, state agencies have a role, local government, I mean, everyone has something, private sector, et cetera, um, which is just like herding cats. Okay, so you wanna say, we need flood mitigation work, who's, like the game we played earlier. You know, I was at a table and someone's like, okay, I paid the preparedness charge, the insurance rate, whatever, and it didn't flood. I'm not paying this year, right? It's all over. So that's that. All right, we're in the final section. This is the shortest. And so you guys can wake back up and pretend you were awake the whole time. Okay, so next steps in taking action. Um, last year, Harvey, Harvey, our friend, came to Texas and he was very unwelcome, as you know. Largest rainfall in US history. In some places, over almost 65 inches. Now, in some ways, Harvey did us all a great favor. Because if we can dump 65 inches on a city that really can't move the water to begin with, and they can't clear a two inch rainstorm every single afternoon in August, right? It, in some ways, it does a favor to raise awareness that if it can happen there, it can dump two feet of water where you live, and that's still a problem. Then it didn't, didn't do us a favor because then people say, well, that was a 5,000 year event, and it's never going to happen again. And that doesn't help. Um, Total damage, this is a fictional number, but again, it's probably the floor, okay? 125 billion, I have no idea if that's right. But it's make believe money at that level, so what difference does it make? It's a lot of money, it hit Houston. Damages were driven by wind, so it was a hurricane, even though it wasn't a hugely strong winded hurricane. My NOAA and my NASA friends can correct me on that if I'm wrong, but surge was big. The pluvial flooding was big and the river flooding was big. There was water everywhere. And then of course the infrastructure didn't really work and there were some reservoir problems and then more water came. And so this was a disaster, which is an absolute mess. Um, and the response was commensurate. Or I've seen this, but again, I just can't get over how many colors there are <laughs> in Houston. More struck by the fact that almost everyone has insurance. Like if this were Boulder, Colorado, there would be so, so many fewer dots, fewer people, but fortunately, like no one buys it except for in Texas. Okay, who was impacted? Now I wanna, does anyone know what IA is? Individual assistance, you know who gets IA, who gets individual assistance? You have to qualify, you have to be poor. You have to have a, be under a certain financial threshold. So you think about, that, who got impacted? There was a lot of people who were in this low income, not indigent, because they they're not property owners, right? So low income property owners or renters who qualified for IA. This is a really sad picture for Houston. All right, so now the rain thankfully has stopped. It's a year later, here are all the stakeholders. There is more than this. Um, but when you think about who does what, you know, you have, everyone has to dig in their pocket and pay for something, thankfully, and the role of the federal agencies is that they pay the most. That's the way it should be. That's the way we're structured. We can't handle it. That's for the feds. Army Corps, FEMA, HUD, they take, DOT, they take the biggest ones. That's where most of the, of the public assistance goes to. And then HUD is the big one for long-term recovery. You guys already know that. But there's a bunch of other roles to go along. So this is where everyone in Texas is now. And so now a program starts to take shape from all of that, if you can believe it. Um, and we're calling it the Pilot Program on Flood Resilience in Southeastern Texas, only because we are that creative with our naming. Um, <laughs> Maybe we'll get a better name as we get started here. So the who, what, where, why, when, let me just run through this really quickly, the why. What problem are we trying to address here? 
two big things. What Harvey demonstrated was that there was this, the maps that they had were inadequate. And there's no indictment in that statement. I am not saying anyone did anything wrong. I'm just saying that the maps they had were inadequate. And so people were making decisions on outdated, inaccurate, or incomplete information. And that created a whole different set of problems. That's the problem we're trying to solve. How do we get better information into the hands of people who have to make, good, who have to make hard decisions in times of chaos, right? That's why. This is, in strip everything else bare, this is what we're trying to do. This is the role of science benefiting society. Okay, the what. what are we doing? We want to get, like I'm looking around the room and I'm so excited about all that you guys can do <laughs> with maps and, and data, because we want to get a more integrated way to visualize the risk, the hazards, and the impacts. And this goes to not just the physical stuff, the physical stuff we have down pat, but who's in the way? Can we take CDBG data, community development block grant data, which is tabular, inform all the time can we turn that into spatial data because if you can if we can then we have a new level of, of demographics to get at who's in the way of this water census tract data only goes so far because it, it's it's uh it's it's broad maybe even at the parcel scale here so we want to get new maps and other visualizations to be able to communicate the hazard the risk and the impacts of flooding and the southeastern texas part is houston Harris County, Beaumont, and Port Arthur. Those are the four places. So desired outcomes, and we haven't started, we're starting in January. Um, we want new partnerships. You guys are all scientists. You already know that we get along in a bumpy kind of way and we like to talk to ourselves, those who understand us best. The federal agencies really get along in a bumpy kind of way. Um, so there's partnerships that need to be nurtured, enhanced uh, along the way. That's really important to get the right people. And we just want to also increase the understanding of what these different dimensions can look like in, south, in southeastern Texas, because what happens in southeastern Texas might apply to Florida, Alabama, South Carolina. There's a lot here that's applicable to other places. Um, we want strong communication of risk around flood, better foundations for decision making. And there's a piece here about getting the information from the community. As a scientist, as a Harvard trained person, I, I've been taught that you know, we, sh I, we should tell people what they need to know, because we know. But there's a piece that we need to understand from people who have lived through the floods, fear the floods, where is the impact that we can't get that granularity? So it's also about the information from the community as well as information to the community. Expected outputs, so these are outcomes. And what are we gonna do? We are going to produce things, um, maps and other visuals that get these four dimensions we were talking about. Um, really wanna get at these different sources of flooding. Do the pluvial sources look different than the riverine ones? And I can, tell, I can tell you right now the answer is yes. How? I'm not sure, but yes. Um, impact. And then we have to write some stuff, so we'll have some few written reports along the way. But we're looking forward to having an annual conference on this. And it'll start in Texas, and hopefully it can go other places. You know, here's an idea, and I'm not advocating this, but, you know, this is the kind of thing that we hope it can not look like, but a channel, perhaps. You know, this is a parcel scale, interactive set of maps. It's like Zillow for your real estate, but it's on flood. So, you know, do you get flooded? How many post flooding events? And this one's interesting because it's not about how many times did it flood with the current owner, it's how many times did that parcel flood. And in Texas, when the property changes over, that number goes to zero, right? So you sell me your house, it flooded twice with you, but I buy it, it's never flooded with me. So someone comes to me and they say, is your house flooded? I say, no, never flooded. 
flooded once. Oh yeah, flooded once. But now it's really three times and I sell it to Al. And you know what I mean? So here is an account of how many times the parcel has flooded. Stuff like that. I mean, this is imperfect, but wouldn't it be nice to be able to have that on your phone or something like that? So we're looking at bringing in AI, lots of layers of mapping, remote sense data, all kinds of stuff to build these kinds of tools. Um, so who's involved? So the state of Texas came in with $4 million of spendable money. Now, anyone here work in a soft money environment or academia? So this is actually like six and a half million dollars and they cut the indirects and gave us four. FEMA came in with a match. And then we have other partners who are coming in. Um, so this is gonna be like a $10 million project. This is non-trivial. I don't know if you could do it for, for cheaper. And then we're going to do it over about four years. So that's who invo who's involved. That's about the scale of it. Those numbers might change, but that's about the scale of it. Um, and that's kind of the scale it takes. Four years is probably the minimum amount of time. Um, so four years, and we're beginning in January. So stay tuned on that. That is the end of, chap of Act 3. I'm going to say thank you and take any questions you might have. Oh, yeah. I, no, I mean, listen, that's what I was just kind of showing as an example. I'm not, it, you're right. There's, I don't, like, what, what was it? In 2014, and literally under the cover of darkness, the Congress rolled back the, um, Bigger Water. So Bigger Water's changed NFIP to go from, it, it kind of took out the grandfather clauses. It went to a risk-based system, right? And then two years later, Congress was like, what, Louisiana? What? No, I mean, it does exactly what you're saying. No, suddenly my property is not, now it's not insurable and it does flood. And if we have a risk-based pricing system, what does that do to coastal Louisiana? What does it do to New Orleans, right? So there's a huge pushback. And under the cover of darkness, on a rider that was attached to a transportation budget, I'm not kidding, I know this because I got 17 calls at 8 o'clock in the morning the next day, this is where they turned it back, and it was called like the homeowner's insurance fairness, some, what was it? Yeah, right. So absolutely, what you're saying is right, there's a lot of sensitivity around it. I'm not exactly sure about the interactive piece on the phones, but this level of layering of that kind of information, it might not be available to the public. It might just be available to first responders. We haven't gotten there yet because we haven't really started, but the end user piece is huge. Like who the partners will be, who, who it's for is, is a really big piece, but y your point's an excellent one. Oh, it's, it's fraud. It's fraud. There's no question that it's fraud. That's right. Um, and on the privacy bit, if, if that's in, all, in any way attached to NFIP privacy stuff, that's a whole, that's a whole different vat of trouble. So there, yeah, there, it is fraud. The trick is the parcel scale. And maybe it's a neighborhood scale, but the granularity of flood impact is literally, I mean, it's, not, it, it's just not uniform. You know what I mean? So houses flood next to houses that don't. 
So which ones are those and, and why is that? I will be here tomorrow. <laughs> That's right, that's right. So we should exchange cards. Um, I don't mind strangers at all, but you're not like a creeper, right? <laughs> just kidding, I'm just kidding. I was just kidding, mom. No, um, yeah, we should, I mean, it does. There, and the thing is, I think that this big project, there is some piece, there are some pieces that might need to be created, but there's mostly, it's about knitting stuff together that kind of already exists and seeing, you know, what that, seam, what that seamstress work is, at the at the nexus that, that I think is where we're going to end up um, too and and you're right there's there's tons there's there's a lot out there so I think that it's a matter of collecting integrating layering sorting so thank you maybe one more question and then we're gonna move on to the next part if there is another question oh I didn't mean to Shut you all down. Okay, then, um, oh, having done Charleston, now looking at Houston, what kinds of things do you anticipate being different to think about? Um, the size is non-trivial. The, the difference in size is non-trivial. Um, Charleston is 200,000 people. This area we're talking about is seven million people, you know what I mean? Six million, seven million people. That's non trivial. Um, and then the other big difference is that FEMA's flood risk map software, uh, kind of, what is your name? To Albert's point, like they really want to improve that. Um, desperately want to improve it and and so there's a there's this built-in friendliness actually between the state of Texas and the federal agencies we're working with that we never enjoyed in in Charleston the um, South Carolina was particularly suspicious of anyone from Washington um, and they got comfortable with us because I was like, we're not part of the federal government. And finally, they were like, well, thank God. But, you know, DHS is and FEMA is and NOAA is. So um, NOAA they were okay with because they have a they have a office in Charleston. So they're okay with, <laughs> you know what I mean? But I think those two things will be very big differences. And I think that this, just the scale on the size and the um, freshness of Harvey as a memory are, is the other thing. You know, I mean, up until last week, the biggest thing that happened in Charleston since Hugo in 1989 was an ice storm that took out a bridge. You know, they were like, we had an ice storm. It took out a, bri it took out a couple of bridges. And it was like a really big disruption. But 1989 Hugo was like, yeah, I wasn't here. I didn't live here. I wasn't born. You know, there was stuff like that. So I think that the, that the, that the, Front of mind awareness of flooding in Houston is always right. In before Harvey, it's right here all the time. And I think that that's a huge difference than, than Charleston. All right. Thank you very much, Lauren. My pleasure.